Welcome to The People's View, a program dedicated to discussing local, state, and national issues and their effect on the American people. The People's View provides a platform for state representatives and national figures to present their viewpoint. Whether it's social, economic, or financial topics, you'll hear it on The People's View. Hello and welcome to The People's View. This uh, People's View is sponsored by the Nashua City Republican Committee and uh, we have a website, nashuagop.org. If you want to see more about uh, the facts of what's going on, what uh, programs the uh, Republican <coughs> Committee sponsors, and other information on some of these uh, People View episodes, go to that uh, website, uh, uh, nashuagop.org. Today, we have uh, Richard Heitmuller, who's uh, Heitmuller, who's uh, the uh, running for candidate, uh, running as a candidate from Ward Four. Correct, Richard. Can you tell us why you decided to run? You haven't run before in politics, and now you're running for uh, uh, Ward Four. Well, basically, I like what's going on in the last two years, mm -hmm. and I detest what went on the four years before that. Absolutely detest. When we took over two years ago, or the, almost two years ago, we had a budget deficit of $900 million. Mm -hmm. We had the highest corporate tax in the whole United States. We had a whole <coughs> parcel of regulations that were job killing. And we had all kinds of problems with regard to economic and personal liberties. And so far as I was concerned, that was over the, over the mark. So when the opportunity came to see what we could do in two years, and I've got a five-page list of all of the bills that have been, been passed by the House mm -hmm. uh, on various and sundry things. It's very impressive, but there's still a lot of work to do. To say the least. Right. <laughs> there's still a lot of work to do, right. and the first thing we have to do First thing we have to do is we have to win the election to hold on to the House, to hold on to the Senate, to hold on to the Executive Council, and to get our man in the Ovid into, into, right. the, Oval, into the, the, the corner office. It's not the Oval Office. <laughs> so what's your background, your professional background? Your, uh, where do you, what have you been doing all your life? <laughs> Well, uh, I have uh, a doctorate in organic chemistry, and I started my career as a research chemist, and I went through the chairs and got to be a, <clears throat> a research director. And uh, in fact, right down the road, the first times I came to, uh, to uh, Nashville was to come to the turkey uh, farm. Oh. Because... Uh, we had our laboratory in Billerica, and at that time it was a, a, a two-lane road. Mm -hmm. And we'd come up one, one day a week to go and get uh, club sandwiches, the best in the world at the turkey farm. The Green Ridge Turkey Farm. Green Ridge, yeah. Yeah. Now what is it now, Barnes and Noble? Barnes and Noble. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, I got started as, as that. I, along the way, uh, uh, one of my bosses said, you know, I've got a crazy idea would you mind taking over running these divisions? And I thought, uh, you know, I don't know a damn thing about running divisions, but he said, well, you know, we'll make it right and so forth and so on. And it was, it was a very lucrative thing to do. So I jumped in and, and uh, started to run divisions. Found out I was pretty good at it. Along the way, there was a bump in the road and the company went uh, sour and I ended up uh, becoming a consultant. Mm -hmm with the Arthur D. Little People in Cambridge. Oh, yeah. At that time, they were the oldest and one of the most prestigious uh, consulting groups in the whole country, maybe in the world. And they were international. And I spent uh, a little over 10 years with Arthur D. Little. Uh, I was, came in as a senior uh, project director and ended up as a vice president. 
And I woke up one morning and said, you know, I can do this all by myself. <laughs> and so uh, on your own. I, I incorporated and uh, made, some, made all the things that I needed to do to be in business and, and began. My company was founded uh, on July 22nd, 1982. And uh, it prospered from day one because I had a very interesting and different uh, business model. And uh, I continued to work uh, on that, uh, on that uh, business uh, until I retired. And I retired twice. Uh, the first time I retired was in 1968. And uh, I was winding down things. And a little bit two years later, Somebody knocked on my door and said, you know, would you be on this board? Well, I had already been on four other boards, and so I thought that I'd be comfortable there. And so I took the, uh, the job of, of, a, of, of a director of a company down in Fall River. That's Massachusetts. And uh, that was a lot of fun, except they were in trouble, too. And after I'd been there for about a year and a half, they asked me to take over the business and to run it. So for two years, I ran a business that was in free fall and trying like the blazes to get somebody who would be interested in buying it mm -hmm. so we could go out of a Chapter 11 and, and, go, and, and, and avoid completely a Chapter 7. Mm -hmm. And that worked out. We, find, we, we scoured the world literally to find somebody to, to make this thing. They were making elastic thread like Lycra. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found somebody in Italy who agreed to buy us, and they bought us. And uh, as part of the deal, they asked me to stay on as chairman of the board, which I did. And I did that until I got tired of it, and then I completely retired. So your business experience is what's going to help you up there. I think we brought a lot of business people in. I think, in this last two years, and I think that helped a lot. Like well, some of this I, along, along the way, when I was with Arthur D. Little, they sent me to the Harvard Business School for the mm -hmm. Advanced Management Program, which really opened my eyes. With, I, you know, I didn't know what, how to make a balance sheet uh, <laughs> until I went through that. I didn't know why the top line and the bottom line always balance. But uh, uh, that was a wonderful experience. Uh, at the time that that happened, that was the oldest, the most expensive, and the most prestigious uh, executive program that existed. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, that's my background. And uh, I look forward to using that and places where I can use it and help. Budgets, I was on the audit committees mm -hmm. of uh, more than one company at the board level. And these kinds of things, I think, uh, where you bring somebody in with common sense makes a lot of, a lot of sense. Well, Most people don't understand that the way businesses keep their books and have to keep their books is not the same as the way states and local governments keep their books. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we have to do is we have to uh, show people how the way that state and local governments keep their books allow for a lot of fudging. And when we hear, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're in a surplus mode, and you find out that the surplus is from borrowed money. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound like a surplus to me. Well, that's because you're, you're in a different mode from, from, the, from the rest of them. But that's, in fact, that's what the Dems did to the state of New Hampshire when they were running the, the, the show. Oh, yeah. They had a little bit of smoke and mirrors where you were getting and They had a couple things. They, they sold uh, something from one division to another division and took the capital gains. Incredible. <laughs> You used a, a buzzword that I, I like to hear a lot, and that's the liberty in, our, in, in one of our conversations. And, and liberty, uh, it, uh, one of the things that I think a lot of us are fighting for are less regulations uh, handed down from the government, uh, the, the intrusiveness of government in, in our lives. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, we ended up with, with a tremendous amount of regulations that came from and job-killing regulations that came from the Dems, and, and a lot of these have been turned back by, by the House. Uh, I think uh, we've gotten to the point where the fees and, 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 and the various tax increases, which are impinging on, on our liberties, uh, are gone by the boards. You know, I ran my own company, so I know what happened under those four years uh, 
with regard to the number of increases in, in the uh, unemployment uh, uh, part of the, of the business and, mm -hmm. and uh, stuff like that. So yes, that, that you have that. But every time there is a regulation, the problem is the definition of the regulation, even if it's written down as precisely as people, good people can, can make it, always allows for things oh, on the edges mm -hmm. to creep in the wrong direction. And, and on, top, on top of that, uh, <clears throat> the agencies were able to keep some of the fines and stuff as extra income <laughs> outside of the budget. I think we're in the process of stopping all of that so that it goes back to the general fund. Well, it, it turns out that that practice is extant. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they even have, there is even a, a word for it in the government, and I can't recall it right now. Mm -hmm where they need some extra funds, so send Joe out to plant B and find out what we can shake them down for. Right. So yeah, that's, that's a bad thing. And you know, when you have a huge bureaucracy, what do bureaucrats do? They sit there and figure out how to solve one problem, and when that's done, they have to have another problem to solve. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they've got no place to go and for their $70,000 a year salary plus benefits. So this is the problem. <laughs> yeah. But there are, there are some, uh, you'll find some people up there that really want to do a good job and uh, want to change some of the uh, ways of doing things. But they're not as many as you'd like to see. And you brought up something about audits earlier. I think that's one of the things that uh, uh, the speaker's looking at. The audit, uh, how well the agencies go and take the information on those audit reports, because they do have a, a good audit group up there, and do something and correct their operation. Uh, and a lot of them just are ignoring them. Well, there's no inspector general in, in, in uh, the government, uh, at least not, not in our government. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, you just have to keep after them. I think one of the, one of the shockers for me was that the uh, front page uh, story in, in, in the uh, Telegraph that uh, showed the salary of the president of the uh, University of New Hampshire oh, yeah. and then what that salary could buy for various things. Absolutely shocking, 300 and some thousand dollars for, for uh, you know, uh, that's, that, that's well, mind-boggling. Looking through that whole list, there were several, I mean, not just the president, but the whole hierarchy. Well, there was over 100 uh, people that were over $100,000. Well, speaking of audits, I know that right now we have a committee called the Redress of Grievance Committee. And uh, there is talk about it uh, expanding its authority as far as being an oversight committee. Uh, I think that the Senate has something to that mm -hmm. level so that there can be a little bit more accountability to whether it's the Liquor Commission or, or any other of these departments that, that go under an audit. Uh, and mm -hmm. it, it that allows for transparency. That's one of the big things that we really need up there. Uh, it, it, when you shake a little bit, and you know the, the hornets start uh, getting all, "Hey, don't don't disturb my little nest here." Well, you know, if you run a business, you have to have an auditor. Somebody has to come in from the outside, and you pay them to do this, and they look through everything that you're doing, and it's their responsibility to tell you what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right, and hopefully, in some in some instances to help you uh, do things better. But uh, that's uh, very important and it doesn't happen in government. So well, that's what we're trying to make it happen. <laughs> exactly. Well, there, there, there you are right there. Mm -hmm. This is why you look for multi-skills. And you know, we've got 400 reps and sure as heck we should find uh, uh, a number of people who have skills and experience well. in this kind of uh, business. Are you meeting with the, your, your, your constituents and the prospective constituents in your area? Are you having any feedback from them at all? The only feedback that I get, and I'm, this is a bit, little bit like talking, preaching to the choir, you know, when you start out on a situation like this, you talk to, your, to the people that you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know any Democrats, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. But, uh, but uh, I think that what I'm, what I'm feeling is that there is more under the table with regard to resentment with what's going on in Washington than we're seeing in the polls and so forth and so on. And I think we're going to uh, benefit from that, and I'm certainly planning to benefit from that. I hope you're right, but I, I agree with you. I've been seeing more people saying they're undecided that uh, you know, how they're going to vote. 
and they're waiting to see how the, the debates go and how, what comes up right towards the end because these, they think that there's something that's going to happen. People are nervous. Yeah. You know, people, people are very are, nervous. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very nervous. And, you know, there are more undecided voters in this state than there are Democrats and Republicans combined. And that, I think, is, is uh, something to, to think about because what's happened is there has been a, an attrition in the Republican ranks, people moving from Republican to undecided. I think I, you're right. I think that was the George Bush effect. <laughs> but, uh, so your, your uh, campaign going all right for you? Are you looking for uh, some other uh, assistance? Or how, how should people get in touch with you if they want to? Well, uh, what I, I need uh, is uh, we, ha we need a lit drop in, mm -hmm. in, in uh, Ward 4. It turns out that there has been a lit drop in Ward 4. Well, One. Okay. Nobody has ever looked at Ward 4 from the standpoint that we could win it. Uh -huh. You know, Dave Cody has been in grade as a rep right. for 30 years, 15 <laughs> consecutive Terms. elections. Might be time to change. And Mary Gorman has been in for seven consecutive elections. Mm -hmm. That's 14 years. Yeah, it's time for change, plus the fact that they were both in grade in the part of the ward, which is across the river, and they don't represent us at all in any manner, shape, or form. Where is uh, Ward 4 located? What, what part of town? If you take the Nashville River, mm -hmm. okay, north of the Re Nashville River, across Broad Street, uh, up to the Amherst Am 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 Street, and then uh, on the other side, you've got the Tree Streets, uh, you've got Main Street, and that goes down to uh, what? You go down to the Merrimack down? Or or is that? Uh, I'm not quite sure where that where that uh, ends. Whether that's uh, Kinsley seven, Street. I know seven is, comes in there. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In any event, uh, the the biggest part of 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 our of our ward is across on that side of the river, and so uh, that's. We ought to do some big lit drops. And there's some there, so. some changes that have, have taken place. You know, when I first came here, uh, St. Louis was a, a a church where French was spoken. In fact, uh, up until a very few years ago, when Father Diane was, was reassigned, mm -hmm. there was a French mass every Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the same anymore. Well, maybe some people will be listening to this show, and if there's a way of contacting you, do you have a phone number or an email address? Uh, the phone number that we have in our, in our lit literature uh, is 889, that's area 603, 889 Four five two six. And that's the best way to get in touch with you. That's the best way to get in touch. Or, or I have questions. I, also, they can use my personal uh, uh, email address, mm -hmm. which is heitz, H-E-I-T-S, mm -hmm. at comcast.net. Oh, very Heisen. good. Well, I think we've run out of time. Richard, I appreciate you coming on, and good luck in your uh, getting elected. I know uh, your talents can be well used up in Concord. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, and thank you. you for running.